Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Contemporary Issues class. Thanks for coming out today. We're going to have a great presentation by Ron today on a social contemporary topic, uh, White Rural Rage, it's called, by the book. He'll hold up the books, I'm sure. But uh, we've talked about urban rage in the past also, and so uh, a good timely topic in this election year. But before we do that, I uh, want to welcome any first timers that we have. Are anybody here for the first time? Okay, that's right. I'm Steve. That hi, Helen. Uh, I'm Steve, the leader of the class, and we'll have a sheet going around. If anybody would like to sign up for our weekly email uh, that goes out to talk about what we have coming up, please put your email address on there. Um, and before we start uh, our usual announcements, Zoomers, nice to have you all here, Joe and Susan and Judy Ann and Sue. And please mute yourself in the lower left corner of your screen when you're not talking. And we are recording this for future playback on YouTube for those who like to watch later, share it with friends. Sometimes people do that, send these videos to friends. We have a potluck lunch today too. You, uh, Vicki, you wanna say anything about, we're in the library? We're in the library um, and uh, we will have, <clears throat> Just um, paper plates and stuff provided, place to in water and coffee if you want it. So if you didn't bring anything, I'm sure there'll be plenty of food. Come and eat it. Good. Any other announcements of things going on or things? I want to give a plug to the sermon today. I thought it was especially good by Rev. Jerry about how we need to put our faith into action. And... Uh, I got a kick out of one reference about uh, pulling up the fish net, and there were 153 fish in there. And I, as a retired newspaper reporter who was trained to ask questions, I thought, who counted those fish? Yeah. <laughs> he came up with 153. And Jerry kind of answered that, that it was, it was probably not actually anybody counting. It was yeah. more of a reference to 10 commandments plus seven <laughs> other things plus, yeah. plus other things. It's numbers, you know, symbolic numbers, and it came up with 153, and so somebody put it in the Bible that way, <laughs> which is kind of those things that happen in the Bible, like 40 years in the desert. It wasn't exactly 40 years, probably. It just meant a long time. Like, so, back then. so I like hearing those background kind of things that uh, Jerry often shares with us. Um, and other things, prayers for Gaza in the news, the fighting that keeps going on in Gaza and rescued four hostages, which was good, but how many civilians died, we don't know exactly. Uh, very sad. Uh, prayer, peace someday will come there, but what a long, sad thing. Pardon me? What about Ukraine? And Ukraine, we will kind of forget about Ukraine, and don't we? But, uh, and oh, Sudan, okay. yes. Yeah. In a couple of weeks, we are having uh, a young man from Sudan come back and speak to us again, a friend of Peter's, and it will tell us about the situation in Sudan, too. So we'll uh, hear a little different part of the world. Zelensky even went to the Philippines. Zelensky went to the Philippines, yeah. Eric said. Well, the last, yeah. last week. Oh, yeah. yeah, very uh, violent world we still live in. Okay. Okay. With that, we want to give plenty of time for Ron to present. And so for anybody that doesn't know Ron, he's a retired engineer, does many of our presentations on uh, social issues, book reviews, and uh, will you take comments during your presentation yes. today, Ron? Okay. Yeah. okay. So if you've got a question or comment, just raise your hand and jump right in. Okay. How many here uh, grew up on a farm? I know we've got at least a few. One, two, three. Okay. How about a small town? Small town? Small town. Very small, small town. town. Okay. Small town. Yeah. We'll probably talk about what constitutes a small town too. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. We'll also mention that maybe one of the big struggles of, of humanity is the fact that in the last 150 years, we've had to transition from a largely agrarian economy mm -hmm. to an industrialized, motorized, uh, society and 
most of us, if we were living in 1800, made our living with a shovel and a pick and a hoe and bailing and raising cattle. And now, 200 years later, we're living hunched over a computer <laughs> and watching big screens. And it's just, and we're still, as a people, uh, trying to adjust to it. Even our body psychology, we used to get exercise every day, working out in the fields, digging, hoe, and plowing. Now we're all getting center. obese because we're in front of a computer <laughs> drinking Pepsis and donuts and yeah. yeah. So and, and we're still trying to adjust to that world. Uh, so with that, let's get going. Again, the book Right Rural Rage. It's a bit controversial. At the end of this lesson, I hope I don't get chased by some mad farmer with a pitchfork <laughs> chasing me down the hall. A couple other books. Uh the Left Behind, Decline and Rage in Small Town America. Pass that around. Um, a book that most people don't know about and don't want to know about, but it portrays a history of much of our country that has kind of been pushed aside, hidden. Uh, we don't want to know about it, but it's, it's real. Uh, the book Sundown Towns. We'll pass that around. A book written by uh, Catherine Kramer. Wisconsin, the politics of resentment. She went out into the countryside of rural Wisconsin, spent a year out there, just in coffee shops, talking to small town and rural people to understand what are they feeling, what's going on, and uh, an excellent book. Okay, let's get going here. First cartoon I love again. Do you ever pray, Lucy? That's kind of a personal question, isn't it? Are you starting to trying to start an argument? I suppose you think you're pretty smart, don't you? I suppose you think, and he says in the last panel, you're right. Religion is a very touchy subject. And, and so is this, this rural issue. Next slide. Oh, I love Peanuts cartoons. I, I know yeah. Steve's a fan of them too. And now the number one hit across the nation. The nation's in sad shape. <laughs> <laughs> Just think the music. Next one. Again, some of the books. We passed those around. And slide four. Okay. What are the key premises of this book? And some people uh, felt the book has come down too, uh, too hard on rural America. And it's been a bit unfair. But the key premises are uh, the support for key democratic principles is faltering in white rural America. There's too much distrust of fairness of elections out in the rural areas. The conspiracy theories are more are stronger out there, and there's more of an embrace of authoritarianism. Um, next slide. Uh, what is authoritarianism? It's I think important more important than ever that Americans and people around the world get a better understanding of authoritarianism and what it is. It's a political system characterized by the rejection of democracy and political plurality. That means you don't want a whole bunch of groups. You don't want uh, different voting and more parties in one. So it's a rejection of that. It also is wanting to look to a strong man, powerful leader, an authority figure to kind of practice dictatorial practices and lead you through the uh, difficult waters of life. Uh, a guy by the name of Juan Lenz wrote a 1964 book called An Authoritarian Regime, Spain. And he was looking at Spain and he says, here's the four key qualities of a uh, authoritarian thing, limited political pluralism, that means multiple parties, uh, Constraints on the legislature, political parties, and interest groups. Uh, political legitimacy based on appeals to emotion. Big rallies, uh, Nuremberg's, that kind of stuff. Uh, mass mobilization, collecting big groups of people together. Suppression of anti-regime activities, trying to suppress opposition. And ill-defined executive powers, often vague and shifting used to extend the power of the executive, a more powerful executive. Next one. Okay, here's the county voting pattern in the pre 2020 presidential election. 
red, the more red it is, the more it went Republican, the more blue it is, uh, the more it went uh, Democratic. And we can see on a county basis, uh, there's no question. If one county, each, each county got a vote, uh, the Republican Party would have almost total control of every state and every region. But if we look at the population distribution of the United States, and you look, we look at that, uh, that map over there, we see where there's tremendous population concentrations in small areas. You go into places like North Dakota, Endless Prairie, uh, you don't find people. I even read in the uh, Congressional District 4 here in the primary, uh, half the, is it half the population of District 4 is in Douglas County? Really? I think that, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a tremendous <laughs> amount. Uh, just shows you how much population is concentrated. Is District 4 the same one that Bulbert's trying to? Yes, yeah. yeah. And it's both basically the Eastern Plains and a big, big bite of Douglas County, if not all of it. Okay. Big area. So it just it, it just shows you how America is concentrated in cities. And we're seeing this worldwide. Mexico City has what? 13 million or something? 22 million. 22 million. You know, my gosh. Yeah. And they all basically in the last 100 years have come in from the rural areas yeah. of Mexico. And this is happening all over. The Philippines, if you look at geographically how much area the Philippines take, no it's not that much. But they have at least a third of the population of the United States. They've got 100 million people living in the Philippines. And, and if you subtract the jungles of Mindano and, and uh, Bataan and whatever, tremendous uh, urban uh, concentrations. Yeah. Next slide. Little mega city. Alice and I lived for, uh, what, three years in little Waverly, Ohio, population 5,000, about an hour south of Columbus. And in that county, uh, it was about 96% white, okay? Your chances during the day of encountering a person of another eth ethnicity or a race was no. not likely to happen. You could go through the whole day and not see anybody but a, uh, a white like me uh, person. Uh, next slide. So... Here, the book author says, here are the four compounding factors of rural rage. There's kind of a, an anger and an upsetness coming and arising from much of rural America. They're angry. They don't like the change that is or isn't happening. And uh, the book author says, here's the, the key factors for it. Number one is white despair. Uh, if we look at the data, it's hard to see this chart, but this is the uh, middle-aged white mortality. And this is a number of overdoses, suicides, and alcohol-related deaths per 100,000. And we can see between the year 2000 and 2015 how it's really gone up. That top curve is men with a high school degree or less. Uh, the orange curve right below it is women. Uh, and that curve's gone way up. Uh, so we're seeing that the limited to high school people in the rural areas are, are really having a lot of despair. It's taking lives through fentanyl, uh, drugs, alcohol, suicide, and misery. And that, that factor is definitely there. Whereas the folks with a four-year degree, uh, their curves are staying fairly flat in those rural areas. That's the bottom. That bottom end, yeah. But the four compounding factors, again, are white despair, outsized political power. We'll touch on that. There's actually more political power per capita residing in the rural areas by far than the uh, urban and suburban areas of America. The veneration of white culture and values and the media, media triggering of whites. Next slide. Looking at Colorado, this is the prosperity in Colorado. Where does the money lie? And the darker the blue, the more financial prosperity there is. Ron, how old is that? Just uh, this is maybe this is 2017, so the date. Very recent. Okay. But it's pretty, pretty, fairly recent. But we can see, and I remember talking to a legislature in about the year 2002, and he was saying to me, 
for the last 20 years, we've been seeing a decrease in rural Colorado in terms of uh, population, economic growth. It's it's very flat, it's slumped, it's going down in several of the counties. You can see where the prosperity is in Colorado. It's along the front range. And where the despair is, it's down in the, uh, uh, the southeast corner in particular. Uh, that's just, just a fact. And of course, politically, we can see the blue, the, uh, the Democratic wins are along the, uh, the wealthier regions and the, the, the economically distressed areas very much uh, going GOP. So, Ron, the blue in the middle, the big vertical blue in the front range, pretty much? Yes. Yeah. Is that black or blue? I mean, there's a purple and purple blue, and then there's. Yeah. There's different, that's degrees. I'll, I'll pass around the, 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 the chart. At any rate, it just shows you the concentration of wealth in the state. It's very, very, very different depending on where you are. Change in jobs by county types. Six out of 10 rural counties lost jobs in the last two decades. Uh, out there on that uh, final chart, non-metro rural areas lost jobs between 2000 and 2019. And the stronger growth is definitely occur occurring in the major metro areas, the ones to the left. Next slide. Okay, again, a rural economic slide. Between 2010 and 2020, 53% of United States counties lost populations. More than half of our counties lost populations between those two decades. Two thirds of the rural counties lost population over the decade. Wow. Ron, is that because the population is going to the cities? Absolutely. Primarily. Mm -hmm. In fact, in a survey, a 2018 survey, 61% of non-metro adult respondents said they would advise teens to move away. Wow. Of course, you go into the uh, urban areas, 40% of the adults advise the youth to say the same. <laughs> but, but far more youth are told in rural areas, you got to get out of here. I remember in uh, Ohio, Sayota County, one person said to me, kids here, they either need to join the army, leave, or go on public assistance. That's about their three choices. Ron, Tennessee was that way, too. Part, parts of it. Yeah. Certain counties. There wasn't anything for our kids there. So, of course, they can't afford to live in the cities now either. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's well, tough. Well, I think a lot of the problem stems from the fact that the United States has really poor public transportation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we don't have hubs when, like, people don't have to live in the cities if there's good transportation, get to jobs. And we, have, I mean, all over Europe, you can yeah. go, you know, yeah, you know, every everywhere <laughs> easily. Here, no, we do not embrace public car transportation. Right. We have no bullet trains. We no. live by the car. We live yeah, by the automobile. Huge factor. Yeah. Maybe low mobility yeah. factor. Yeah. Economic yeah. mobility in the U.S. is now the lowest in the rural counties of the South and the Midwest. So this is where we're seeing the, the greatest economic hurt. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Outsize political power. And we'll touch on this in some future lessons. Again, we've mentioned that the nine most populated states have 50% of the senators. And... Uh, Wow, that's an incredible senators or congress? Senators. Senators. Yeah. Senators. Yeah. Nine yeah. states have 50% of the US population. Mm -hmm. So we have half the population in the United States with 18 senators. The other half of the United States gets 82 senators. Incredible disparity. And uh I thought every state got two, don't? Yeah. Two. Yeah. Stinks every state gets no, yeah. Every, yeah, every state gets uh Two. Two, senators. Two, two, two senators. Two senators. Yeah, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, the electoral college is also right. stacked to give more strength to rural areas. You get your number of uh, uh, representatives, and yeah. then you get tacked on. You get added to uh, two electoral votes just for being a state, which means California and Texas get a bonus of two. 
but North Dakota mm -hmm. and Wyoming also get a bonus of two. So you end up with more political power in small states and rural areas. Because you put together the Senate and the House. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, not just the no. well, yeah. house. The house is supposed to yeah. Yeah. Because it's balance that. Yeah. 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 Right. Supposedly, but with gerrymandering, it doesn't work. Yeah. Also, one person pointed out in the newspaper column this week, what if Colorado's Senate was not proportional based? It is. Which means our Colorado Senate at, at the uh, state level, it's just like the House, and then it's proportional. All the districts have basically the same number of people. What if Colorado had had a all counties get one uh, state senator? That means rural Colorado would have total control pretty much of uh, uh, the state. Okay. Jim. I, I've been an election uh, judge in two elections in Colorado, and I found it to be a very good experience. And I'd recommend it to people who can call the uh, election commission and tell them that you'd be willing to volunteer as a judge. It's a good experience. It makes you feel proud about, about America. Okay. I'm going to put in an ad on this next slide for a, a lesson I'm preparing right now called from the book, The Tyranny of the Minority. And it looks looks at uh, how a disproportionate amount of power has been put in certain sectors of America, particularly the, uh, the rural areas and uh, the difficulties it's uh, it's causing. Who initiates those changes? I'm, I'm sorry? Who are the people that initiate those changes? Initiate the changes? The Constitution will have to be changed. We'll We'll talk about that. Which is good luck. That's we've got. We've got. Robert, we'll mention in the in the when we do this book how we've got one of the most difficult constitutions to change in the whole world. It's very hard to update it and change it. Next one. All right. How many of you have watched the Hallmark Channel? Ladies, put your hands up. Okay. But you ever notice in the Hallmark movies? The young folks always return to the small hometown oh, yeah. to fall in love with a pure and wholesome high school sweetheart that's living in that little small town. Back to the small piece. Yeah. 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 And there's, of course, the uh, I call her Mrs. Uh, Hallmark Channel actress. I think she's their uh, uh, top top notch person. Have one kiss at the end. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, okay. Know <laughs> but someone said, I'm waiting for a, a reverse Hallmark Christmas movie about a small town girl who realizes her community's politics are terrible, <laughs> moves to Manhattan, gets a high pressure office job, meets a businessman, and they host a non denominational <laughs> holiday party at their penthouse. <laughs> Well, that's nice, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then then we have the media triggering of, of whites. Uh, there is a, a heavy uh, radio presence in rural America that pushes very, very hard uh, a, a, a cable news uh, network. And it basically tells them that people not like you are destroying your world. You're getting clobbered by racial and religious minorities, atheists or doubters, feminists, LGBTQs, white liberals, Democrats, and scary people who live in cities. <laughs> it's basically the, the message. The Next elites, one. The elites, too. Oh, right. elites. Elites, yeah. Okay. And of course, those are the four outlets of the core compounding factors. Uh, there's a, a clip off of the uh, All in the Family. Where I, I don't know if anybody watched the movie, it was good, or the, the TV series that ran for 10 years. But Al Bundy formed a little group called uh, No Ma'am. And there they've got Jerry Springer tied up, and they've got Ovulates, a sign on his lap. But uh, racism, xenophobia, anti urban disdain, anti immigrant sentiment, strong acceptance of conspiracies. 
uh, justification of violence is another anti -women. one. Anti-women. What's that? Anti-women. Anti-women, yeah. 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 Okay, next one. Fearful of other tribes. Uh, more fearful, the folks in the rural area are more fearful in, than the general population about the cultural influence of immigrants, minorities, feminists, and whatever. And some things not known very well, in 1871, there was a mob in Los Angeles, Chinatown, that attacked and murdered 19 Chinese residents. And that produced the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, banning the immigration of Chinese laborers. And right here in Colorado, Halloween of 1880, there was a ferocious uh, anti-Chinese riot. Uh, they, a white mob ransacked Denver's Chinatown. Uh, worst, one of Colorado's worst episodes of racial violence in its history. The mob beat one guy to death, injured dozens more, and destroyed Chinese homes and businesses. This is something most of us never learn about. Mm -hmm. It's like but this, it's yeah. Like but but yeah, a very very severe uh, anti-Chinese. Where was this? This was right here in Denver. Yeah, read about it. You don't read hear read. about the American Indians. I've never heard about the Asian part of the whole. Yeah, we we tend to uh, we tend to overlook some of the severe person. We're we're well aware of the. Uh, hostility that's been put against blacks in America. But there's a lot of things that went on uh, persecuting indigenous Americans, the Indians, uh, Chinese, Chinese laborers, and several other groups. Some of the poor Irish immigrants were really Jewish people. Uh, we don't have a real good, the best history. Yeah. Right. Okay. There's a book called Dying of Whiteness, and uh, an excellent book worth reading. Uh, one fellow from Tennessee got interviewed in that book, Dying of Whiteness, and he said, I'd rather die than embrace a law that gives minorities or immigrants more access to health care, even if it helps me as well. They really, there's a lot of folks, in, in, particularly in rural America, that really don't like helping people that don't belong to their tribe. <laughs> but I bet they go to church every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and their parents or grandparents were probably immigrants themselves. Yeah. Yes. yes. A lot of them. <laughs> Interesting uh, fact uh, from that last slide. I, th I think this data is pretty st still, I think it's been improved, but this data is from four years ago, five years ago. One in five children in the U.S. rely on food stamps. That's that's it's a high, pretty high number. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, then, of course, the acceptance of conspiracies as fact. Uh, the two books, The Big Lie by Jonathan Lemire, and the book Disproven, which we mentioned in an earlier lesson. Uh, Ken Block was hired by. Uh, Donald Trump to do an investigation in 2020 to look for election fraud. Uh, yeah, Ken Block yeah. came back and told him there isn't any out there. Yeah. He, so he's written a book, and this book just came out in March. But uh, people want to believe what they want to believe. Next slide. The blame game. Per capita, rural America suffers from as much or more gun violence and drug alcohol deaths mm -hmm. as large cities. A lot of people in rural America want to say, ah, oh, the problems in the, the ghettos, and then, yeah, yeah. it's with other races in big city areas. But the simple fact is rural America has gotten just smashed by fentanyl addiction. Mm -hmm. It's not poor blacks. Huge numbers of rural whites are suffering, more so per capita than most other groups. When, when will we start drug testing elected officials? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> they find a way it. <laughs> and, of course, the rural, the blame game. 
you want to blame the problems of rural areas on minorities, Democrats, whites, uh, or not whites, but other people. But the problems are seldom blamed on Republican legislatures who largely represent them, who represent rural America almost exclusively at all, almost all state levels. And what are they doing to help the rural areas? They often decry a lack of attention to rural needs, but scream at expenditures of funds to help them. <laughs> yeah. We're in a democratic uh, capitalism society, and you can't simultaneously sit in a small town and say, what are they doing to help my small town? And then at the same time saying, I don't want any government spending. Right. What's who's going to I mean, what are you going to do without any money? You know, so it's a pure capitalist and economic forces give no heed to people's basic needs. Pure, raw, unbridled capitalism doesn't care about a kid on food stamps or a lack of a school or a lack of a hospital in, in rural areas. And that's one of the key factors uh, that has to be faced. Uh, pure capitalism has to be bridled. And the, the whole question of politics is, where do you bridle it and how much? But unbridled capitalism will not solve the problems of rural America. Job creation is based on profit maximization. There's a lot of people in rural areas, particularly in small, small towns, that are dreaming, oh, if we could just get a, a big automotive assembly plant to come here, or an aerospace firm to put its research, or pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing firms. Those firms make decisions based on money and profit. They don't say, well, let's go into Urbana, Ohio, and put a new uh, software factory there. That's why John Deere has assembly plants all over the world. My brother-in-law was working in the supply chain he routinely would go to Mexico, Argentina, mm -hmm. France, Germany, uh, <laughs> India, because they assemble parts from all over the world, because that's where it's cheaper to build. <laughs> but but big companies cheaper. are going to build or locate their businesses largely. My relatives live in South Dakota, rural. Mm -hmm. 3M has taken over a whole city and it has grown so much. Mm. And now, Prime is moving in with their warehouse. <laughs> oh. So they're really oh. starting to grow there. And they're, like, they're finding a way to do it then. Yeah, all my relatives work for free and they had to drive to school for them to get there, but other paying jobs. Amazon, okay. share Amazon warehouses. <laughs> all righty. Next slide. Uh, there's the firearm mort mortality for state for 100,000 people. And we can see. There's a lot of very rural white states yeah. uh, that have the worst per capita uh, firearm deaths. So don't blame it all on, on Black America. Next slide. Mexico. Some of the real culprits. There was an article in the Denver Post just a couple of weeks ago, and I should have cut it out and saved it. But it talked about the decline and the struggles of farms. Uh, some of the data. 44% of the small dairy farms in Vermont have shut down since 2012. And the number of farms over a thousand acres has doubled between 78 and 2017. 1940, 53% of rural Americans lived on farms. This is rural Americans. Now only 6% do. So even when you go into the quote, farming regions, small towns, and look at, ask the people who works on the farm you raise their hands, it's not a high number. Most of the people in the rural areas are working at the, the feed store or the uh, the drug store or the, yeah. Yes. They're not out there working on the farm per se. Schools. <clears throat> All right, next one. Federal expenditures per capita. This is data from Wisconsin, uh, but it looked at the rural versus the urban counties in Wisconsin. And they found that as on the x-axis, as the county got more and more rural, the federal dollars per capita went up and up and up. So the rural areas are actually getting, at least in Wisconsin, and I think in most 
areas, more money per capita from the federal government than the uh, urban areas. So in, in terms of a pure fairness doctrine, uh, the rural areas have to remember this. Next. Uh, again, in the rural areas, there's support for undemocratic concepts, higher than normal, lack of a support for a free press, embracing authoritarian figures, support for unchecked presidential power, aggressive military-backed policing, hyper anti-immigrant policies, support for white nationalist and white Christian movements. How many saw an article in the paper this week about a list of the number of extremist groups yeah. in Colorado. Yep. Yeah, it, that's the, scary. The, the sheer number of groups has, I think, roughly doubled in the, in the last decade. So it's not not a good sign. I have to laugh at white supremacists because if they look at the look at the world, the population of the world, the whites are a small, small minority. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're crazy. In a few centuries, in a few centuries, we'll all be people of color. Just, just look at the population around in Asia and in Africa. Yeah, we're a real small minority. So, amen, brother. <laughs> all right, next slide. Justification of violence. Uh, Scavino told uh, the investigators, Scavino was a, uh, a person in the Trump administration, and he told the investigators that as the violence began to escalate that day when the Capitol was attacked, Trump was just not interested in doing more to stop it. So what can you say? Next one. Uh, rural Republicans stroking white resentments. Fun proposed funding policies to solution to rural problems is not happening among the rural GOP congressmen. It's instead, they find they get more political strength by stroking resentments, culture wars, and generating anger is easier than formulating and developing solutions. Next one. Okay, there's uh, Catherine Kramer, Kramer's book. People who might benefit from more government often prefer far less of it. <laughs> and again, there's a huge rural urban divide. Perceptions of perceptions of who's getting what and who deserves it um, are strong drivers and are affected by perceptions of culture and lifestyle differences. Next slide. Issues are often secondary to identities. People often vote depending on, is this person like me? Does this person understand people like me? People understand their circumstances. Often they think of them as the fault of the guilty and less deserving social group, not as the product of broad social, political, and economic forces. So it's easy to blame, oh, it's it's the minorities, it's the immigrants, it's those kids on welfare that are causing my problems. And it's usually something much more fundamental uh, than that. Next slide. All right. <laughs> Possible remedies. Here, here's where the brains, the brain power really needs to be put, and a lot of the money needs to be put. We need to do a better job collecting and dealing with facts and updated data. Uh, there okay. needs to be more training and specialized manufacturing, more training in health and education services. Uh, again, they say many men in their 40s and 50s are repulsed by service jobs. You know, you're not a real man unless you're uh, driving a heavy machinery uh, item. And there's going to unfortunately have to be more relocation. Nobody wants to hear that, but a lot of studies have said many of the folks living in Rust Belt towns and old manufacturing hubs can't be saved. They've got to get, they've got to up up and then move somewhere else. One, There's... one thing for the improvement of society is the education of women. In a lot of countries in the world, they don't educate the girls at all, which is crazy. <laughs> women yeah. improve society. And, 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 
Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. do a better job of educating women. That's a good job in Europe. Yeah. Next one. All right. So I'm anticipating this guy on the left here is going to come after me. Cover me in the hall. <laughs> I want to apologize to the you know, we've got some we've got some fantastic people in America's rural areas. They're they're people of heart, character, soul, uh, whatever. And I don't want this uh, discussion to be thought of as Ron hates uh, farmers or, or rural America. But we're going to have to be a little bit like Bugs Bunny that's come up in an unexpected place there. <laughs> <laughs> figure the smart yeah. Yeah. Uh, figure out uh, figure out a way out of this. So with that, uh, what do we do to defuse and better start to break down this terrible polarization between suburban, urban, rural, uh, and how do we how do we solve and and address the problems of uh, rural America, small towns that are going down, Rust Belt areas? Uh, what do we do other than rather than throwing darts at each other? What are what are some of the solutions? Class, what are, what do you think? I'm thinking. I'm wondering if. Um... getting facts out. And we've got newspapers that are just dropping over like dead flies. And in some of these rural areas, um, they're not getting factual information. Uh, it, it, the Post has that article about the Nevada um, uh, election representative. Yeah, um, who's ran a, a good operation for 20 some years and all of a sudden her own neighbors are signing petitions to get rid of her because she won't embrace yeah the, the uh, cons conspiracy stuff mm -hmm. she's running a tight a tight ship of reality and they're not buying it so <laughs> I'm wondering if there's some way that we could finance. Of course, we'd get slammed by the other side, but somehow or another, um, support independent uh, newspapers. That's a whole other topic too. <laughs> yeah. Immediate decline in the media yeah. uh, effectiveness and fairness and. But that would help solve. Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. point, Linda. You know, Vicky, and then back here. Go ahead. Um, Steve and I uh, offered to bring two of our grandsons here years ago um, from a small rural town in Texas. I mean, really small rural town in Texas, and basically kind of save them from their environment um, and uh, get them out here and possibly help them finish school, help them get on their feet. Um, uh, they both turned us down, but um, my thought about that was if we went and with Steve and I discussed this, had we done that, um, they would not have been able to afford to live here. And so they would have gone back. And then what would we have done? Just gotten them out of that for a short time, you know? Um, so even though we, you know, we discussed, are we doing the right thing to try to get them out of that, you know, mindset and uh, that financial <clears throat> whatever, um, so it's we're poverty like, and no yeah, jobs, and and drugs, and business. you know, just and as it turns out, they're both working, um, they're working, but they're working, you know, fast, fast food. food jobs, <laughs> and and one of them's still living at home, and um, you know, it's just they're they're going to be in that small town mentality mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives, yeah, you know, even though they both had the ability to be better, mm -hmm. you know, so. Did they finish university? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Doing good to finish high Doing school. Doing good. 
I want to give our Zoomers a chance or, here. Karen. Also, Karen. also Karen. after Karen. No, Karen, go ahead, and then we'll go to Zoomers. So um, I'm from a small farming town in Northwest Ohio. And I've been working on this for years, <laughs> um, trying to um, understand uh, the mentality um, from people who, I'm just going to say, never left the area. So during during college, I I did two semesters, lived two semesters in Spain, and traveled North Africa, and blah blah blah, all that stuff. Two of our currently two of our neighbors are Jewish. We have some very close, very good friends who are gay and Muslim, and so my eyes have been open. Although things still catch me because that's where I grew up and never, like when I got to, you're going to all laugh, when I got to St. Andrew and there was social justice and I'm like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and and I, it was just not part of where I grew up, it wasn't a thing, it wasn't a lingo, it wasn't any of that. And when I found out what it was, I'm like, duh. Yeah. Um, but with the people there, um, when my dad, he just passed away in February, but this has been for 10 years before that, I tried to get him a copy of the New York Times. Because he and I would have these conversations. He would watch Fox News. Or, and he would say to me, Karen, how do you know that? And I'm like, I read a lot, I I listen, I study, blah, 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 blah. And he was interested. I could not get the New York Times in paper form delivered to him. Not two days later, not just the Sunday paper. It just, they're not, they're probably not set up because there's no interest. And part of what I was going to get back to was they're not interested. Uh, some of my friends from that area that I'm friends with on Facebook, they put out this information like the Civil War is coming and it's all this other stuff. Sure. And the Biden administration is signing up, the most recent one, the Biden administration is signing up immigrants through Medicare. And I responded back and I'm like, I am so interested to know more about this. What is your source? <laughs> How do you know that? And I put, I hope it's not, I hope it's another source other than Fox News. So, and a couple of other friends, we all know each other, are waiting for the person who posted it to answer. But the only way I've been able to dig in a little bit is to ask questions like that. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. Where, what is your source for the information? Good for you. Thank you for sharing, Karen. Susan had her hand up on Zoom. Susan, go ahead. It seems like one of the biggest issues is a lack of economic opportunity. And, and given the world is, you know, so digital and completely virtual now, training in those areas so that people are proficient with technology and can be engaged in remote work, which globally is a big thing you know i mean how often do one of us pick up the phone to call a vendor and we're speaking to somebody in another state or another country so i i think that technology is is one of the answers and it, it ties back to training and that would not um necessitate people having to move and could potentially build up the economy of some of these rural areas can I add to what Susan said? Yeah. For those who don't know, Susan's in Toronto, Ontario, joins us each week. First, Anne, and then I'll go to you. One of the problems with technology is having good internet connection. My so brother exactly. is yeah. a little yeah. seller in a very small rural area in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and we've had three or four, uh, every conversation we've had since he's been there has been interrupted because he doesn't have enough technology in that area. And I would be surprised if throughout the United States, that's a big problem in the rural area. Yeah. So how can they connect yeah. with technology that they don't have good internet? Yeah, yeah. So that was a One good of our question. class members is in Georgetown, Colorado, 
and uh, would like to zoom into our class, but can't get reliable uh, oh. Oh. internet service in Georgetown. Hmm. Again, with the infrastructure and the challenges of that, I know that there are governmental programs that are trying to provide more sustainable and, and reliable infrastructure um, you know, equipment, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah, you can't you can't work remotely if there's no good connection. Well, okay. In the back, back there. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not an expert on uh, Japanese politics, but they have a similar problem in Japan yeah. where the rural uh, population is moving to the big cities like Osaka, Tokyo. They're having such a big brain drain, but also a cultural brain drain. And the a lot of the culture or local crafts that have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years mm -hmm. in Japan are being lost because there's no one to take on the, that, uh, that craft uh, to future generations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in my limited exposure, uh, my wife and I watched this TV show called uh, Cycling Japan, and these cyclists visit these rural towns all over Japan, and they stop to talk to the local people and get their views about the economy and how they live. And what I found was a common denominator was they, and they actually you can see this in the third Japan in the country, but they are taking uh, homes that have been in the family for many, many years and basically selling them at such a low cost for people to come in and renovate and start a new life. And believe it or not, there are not only Japanese, but foreigners that are seeing that as an opportunity hmm. to uh, hit two birds with one stone. They can start a new life and also help the local economy and culture and things like that. So it was, I don't think it would be, uh, it's a 100% solution to the problem, but at least someone is recognizing uh, the brain drain out there and they're trying to, they're trying to do something about it like we are here. Good point. It's good to see. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Good point. Linda, Got several. Yeah, one thing I have noticed that um, the liberal, and I put quotes around it, viewpoint seems to be you have to have a college education to get with, get anywhere. Mm -hmm. We are not training plumbers, electricians, construction yeah. folks at a level that is that is needed. And I think that that moving that into some of the rural areas, that type of training might be helpful to. Yeah. You know, yes, those people may then move to a city to practice their trade, but um, at least they're getting the training and the jobs right. in areas that are needed. Okay. Yeah, rural Colorado, including the ski resorts, can't get enough electricians, plumbers. They wait months sometimes for yeah. tradespeople to get up there. Because it's hard. Joy? Wasn't rural America a wonderful place to grow up? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel sorry for the kids that don't have that opportunity. It ain't easy. Yeah. That's great. But I, 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 I need everybody on my paper up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop and I talk. They invite me in. It will take me hours to do the collection. Hours. <laughs> <laughs> What's a paper wrap? Yeah. 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 But I always say I'm glad I grew up there, but I don't want to live there. <laughs> I got away from there, and now I go back and I feel sorry for those people that didn't. I mean, it's really pretty pitiful there now. I it was pitiful. Where, where was it? More pitiful. Yeah. Where was it? Where were you? Northwestern Wanda? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Okay. Close to the band. Yes. Very rural. Very, very. Huh? Yeah, but, yeah, we, we have to, this country needs to, needs to consider the internet and utility. We need to have it there everywhere. Yeah. We also need a little bit more critical thinking. Yes. Sometimes we have about this much. 
students. And, you know, that can be through making education uh, more accessible, less costly. Love college football, but, you know, with maybe a little less into the stadium, a little bit more in the teacher's <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. you know, you know, you know, Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Teacher yeah. pay, and that's that's uh, that's a disgrace. Yeah, you have to educate people. Yeah, good. I support yeah. everything you said. Values. We have to reevaluate what our values are. Yeah. And I also yeah. think that uh, we said technology was an issue. I think medicine is an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. All the people. Uh, I'm real familiar because I'm a farmer in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, about the rural areas, you have to go 150 miles to find a doctor yeah. Yeah. in the northern parts of the state. Oh, so the part, in Kansas, I imagine other places, Wyoming, maybe, I don't know. But that's serious. So what happens is they leave the farm, they go to a town of 10 to 20,000 where there might be a hospital and a couple doctors. And so I think that's a major thing, especially for people our age. And the retirement communities are booming because they uh, provide that kind of thing. Those people would like to stay on the farm. They love open nature and they love that, but they can't They can't do it with their mouth. Sure, go ahead. Unfortunately, there are uh, like hedge fund groups that are buying 20 hospitals in the South. Okay. They get their money out and they're closing and that hospital might be a hundred miles away and it shuts down and then how far did they have to go? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's it's this great one guy bought a forty million dollar yacht. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you did it on the backs of people who need them. And maybe this doesn't just... relate a lot, but anytime there's farmland for sale. Who's buying it? Corporation. Over China. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. China. Well, my brother follows all the land transactions. We're and about, and it's a good, that's a whole hour we could do also on China and around the world. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. We're about out of time, but I want to do a Socratic call on our professor of anthropology, Peter oh, Van. Yeah. Ours there <laughs> because he has studied cultures around the world, including rural areas. Peter, would you have a short observation for us about worldwide oh, rural kind of, versus urban? You're kind of ask, but you know, I've had the privilege of working in rural areas uh -huh. as an anthropologist in different countries. Yes, I know. What a privilege. Mm -hmm. All I can say is we've got a bunch of great people in this room who are terrific folks. Probably most of us are progressive or even a little bit toward the left, toward the liberal, as, as do I. But you know, if we have a chance to chat with our rural friends, every time we're in Prowers County, Colorado, or Eastern Peru, I've had privileges in both those places, just the name too, and chat with our rural colleagues and see what they think. Yeah. Not tell them what they should think, but listen to what they think will be one step further ahead. Thank you for asking. That's Good. my opinion. Yeah. We listen probably have a lot in common with them as well as differences, of course, don't we? Yeah, to yeah. listen to our rural colleagues and respect them. Yeah. Even if we disagree. Good point, Peter. Okay. Ron, any closing mm -hmm. comments? No, no, that's uh okay. Great discussion today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zoomers. And for those of us here, let's adjourn to the library for lunch. Okay.